Hi, I'm Eddie Perfect. Max Gillies has made a living out of satirising politicians of all persuasions. His impersonation of Bob Hawke, in particular, is legendary. His 1984 hit TV show, The Gillies Report, not only broke new ground, it taught a whole generation of comedians like me how important it is to laugh at our leaders. But there's a very different side to the man considered by many as a national treasure. One he's kept close to his chest. Until now. It's a while since I've done this, but it's pretty familiar. I'm just trying to remember what character I'm supposed to be today. <laughs> yeah, a General, what kind of job is that? I dreamed I was walking tall down Main Street without any pants on. Good evening, objects. <laughs> Stop it, or you'll go blind. <laughs> My family used to love the Max Gillies show. Quick, quick, get in front of the telly. Max Gillies is on. Well, I oh, come on now. Are you saying that I'm to the right of Genghis Khan? Are you He's one of the funniest guys oh, on yeah. television. He really lifted Australian humour. Well, what's all this about, then? Well, this is a summit on electoral reform. I don't think we'll ever, ever see the like of that kind of production in comedy again in this country. But I'm a voter. No, 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 no. Of course, there were really uh, rich political pickings around this time. Come on, are there any corrupt police or not? New South Wales has got the finest body of police in or out of jail in the country. I think Max pioneered a certain type of political satire in Australia, a direct head-on frontal attack on our most eminent politicians being his, his most effective weapon. It would be um, a whack and a biff with a smile, as opposed to uh, taking uh, a rusty bayonet and putting it through the middle of you. No, politics is full of uh, bloody prima donnas, mate. I remember being completely in awe of the balls of the man, Max doing an impression of Hawk next to Hawk. In short, Michael, and yourself, uh, <laughs> I'm expected to tell these great people around the world, as far as Australia is concerned, they can all piss off. <laughs> Max never really gave away to me what was going on for him. He was a bit shy, withdrawn. Good as it'll ever get, I guess. I sensed there was deeper waters there, maybe a slight sadness there, and that by playing all these characters, he got to step out from that reality that was his world. <laughs> I'm quite happy to go out in front of a, an audience and do silly things. I feel safe doing it because it isn't me. But there is a big difference between all of that and going out and saying, oh, look, uh, this is me and I'd like to talk about uh, my innermost thoughts. It's, no, I've never, I've never found a way to do it easily. So perhaps I shouldn't be here today. It is not my job not to be distracted, Mr Speaker, uh, by uh, those who might seem to engage in some other process. I've always been intrigued by politicians and the theatre of politics. All those with that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Right back. As a child, I was drawn to question time in federal parliament, which was broadcast every day and you'd gradually get to know the voices and the characters became real to you. We have uh, an undiminished belief in the significance of the British Commonwealth in this world. So this was during the long Menzies years when I thought Australian governments never changed. And if I may say so, we have the oldest associations in the world. I used to uh, try to affect his uh, pretentious Anglican royalist tones. Max once told me how that he was a sort of shy kid at school. His way of overcoming that was to be the funniest kid at school and probably also the smartest kid at school. I think it goes with the territory being shy and being a performer. 
Isn't that the central contradiction, particularly for comic actors? The melancholic behind the actor, the comedy, you know, comic actor. There's our father, Frank and Dory. Looking what a handsome young couple. Yeah, sort of happier times there. One of our relatives was heard to say, it's about time Max and Don got over their childhood, don't you think? But <laughs> we didn't get over it. This maybe he was obviously uh, in the armed forces then. Our father, Frank, was serving in New Guinea and we didn't know him from a bar of soap. This is Dad's war record. We'd, I've never seen, I don't think no. you've seen it. No. Uh, so this is what's been secret to us for our lives. Reason for discharge, medically unfit. The very murky memory I have of my father returning from the war was a sense of great anticipation. One anxiety state. Yeah, well, um, could explain a lot, couldn't it? I do remember when he came back, he opened his satchel and took out a hand grenade and pulled the pin out of it and threw it. There was quite a loud bang and uh, there was a sheet of flame. I think he must have thought, well, the boys will be entertained by this. Inevitably, his life and his wife's life completely changed. They've become strangers. At the end of the day, one day, Dad came in and sat on my bed and explained to me very calmly that he would be leaving home and he wanted to make sure that I understood that my brother and I had nothing to do with this matter, whatever had brought it about. I had no trouble understanding this because the fighting had been um, the stuff of nightmares. Mum used to work in an office building in the city. Us kids would be in bed by the time she got home at night and she's always exhausted. It seemed like week after week, she would have all her bills and um, debts, which she would be going through as obsessively. And I'm trying to be rational to help calm her down. She would often complain in the course of this that it would help if she'd got maintenance from her father, but it was never forthcoming. There are questions uh, I have about Dad. Um, how fond of us he really was, but he was off limit. I'd always imagined whenever I left the family home, I would, as soon as possible, reconnect with my father. So it was unfinished business. At university, I was regarded, I think, as a bit of a serious type, uh, over serious, perhaps. But I had my first experience of playing roles in comedy and it made me think this is the place to be and you've got to do this as often as you possibly can. You could say I was escaping from home, going out and having fun. There was a sort of search in the 1970s, I think, for, for the radical elements in Australia. You know, we were untethered, if not unhinged. So there's a lot of dope smoked mushrooms swallowed, um, beds swapped, all sorts of things. Then came the Whitlam government and decided that the arts were important and free expression was important. There are a couple of small theatre spaces opened up in an inner Melbourne suburb of Carlton and the pram factory became a home away from home for me. I was an aspiring young writer, but terrified of the Carlton scene initially. Quite a few of them were influenced by far-left philosophy, that um, status-seeking was evil, everyone was equal. Nobody had any more talent than anyone else. And I met this shambling chap without the slightest trace of charisma, very humble, very softly spoken. And I thought, well, he's not an actor for sure. And then I went to the first show. A fair crack of the whip. 
89 degrees of quicksilver already. I'll cremate. You could almost see the joy in Max's eyes when suddenly his inner beast was released and he could be someone else than shambling, shy, mumbling Max Gillies. Yoo-ho, it's Monkey Wonky! <laughs> Just about every character I played was far less inhibited than I am myself. A strange experience to find yourself liberated, if you like, from your natural reticence, wariness. A perfect specimen of the Pomodoro. I mean, it was like he doesn't come alive until, boom, he's a character, and then it's from zero voltage to 100 volts, bang. And I could see why everyone was raving about him, a great talent. It was the defining political moment for a generation. Then we had the dismissal. For the first time ever, the Governor-General used his reserve powers to remove a Prime Minister. And politics was pretty electric. And everyone involved had a very strong view about what should have happened. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. <laughs> because nothing will save the Governor-General. It was probably the most polarising event in Australian politics since the conscription uh, plebiscites of the Great War. A bitter and sometimes violent campaign followed. But the election on December the 13th brought a crushing defeat for the ALP and for Mr Whitlam. Max sort of comes riding a wave out of that, I think, and putting his own particular stamp on it. The first political satire show we did was called Squirts, and uh, we had a dream that it could be a weekly television satire, and we offered it to the ABC repeatedly, and eventually they took up our offer um, after months and months. and it became a very high-rating television show, The Gillies Report. Good evening. I'm Max Gillies, and most of the people you'll be seeing tonight aren't. The whole place had a, a buzz. It, it, it was terribly, terribly exciting. When it came onto our TV screens in our lounge room, it was like, God, that's Russian. G'day! That's me, Oki Peterson. Now, God, he created Queensland. Oh, get off! <laughs> Can he do that? Oh, he is. Poor little India. And he had global politicians like Thatcher, the Queen, Ronald Reagan. So I... I had to act. I had to act. It was making Reagan so endearing, but pointing out how dangerous he was and what the hell is this person doing in power? But it was, it was perfect. Coffee is our nation's leader. Power and fame are mine. And you soon realised every person was watching it because you get stopped in the street. Oh, I saw last week's episode. The odds have had increased funding. <laughs> How do you like blue poles? It was just such a great wave to ride of uh, a breakthrough in television, I guess. Up until then, we'd not had anything like it. It's time all red. <laughs> time golf. Uh, you know, pissed off. <laughs> Max had good writers, including Don Watson, to give him great, pungent, biting material. Rhyming around like a fool in a big top hat. We found that sympathetic portrayals were often better. I, I don't think it did to be too cruel, really. Particularly with Malcolm Fraser. Oh, there's a job. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered forever? I would. Fraser was a very unpopular uh, Prime Minister because of the way he got to the Prime Ministership and because of his rather unbending nature. It took a while to work Malcolm out, to actually humanise him, make him a, a real person. Aloofness and arrogance uh, can sometimes be confused with a degree of shyness, which I certainly used to be. I found it fascinating to try to get inside this man who clearly had great difficulty expressing himself because uh, I was like that myself. Will Mr Hawke tell the audience uh, why it was necessary to fly around the world like some sort of uh, 
Some sort of, you know, migrating mutton bird. Oh. <laughs> Max was incredibly nervous before he he went on stage. He really suffered for his art. Let me put it that way. He was always brilliant, but always, you know, went through a really tough time to get out there. He was often difficult to draw out. Unlike me, who put a lot of my private life on the stage, um, Max didn't want his private life known about. He was... That was his private life and that was it. I had been living overseas, so I had no idea who Max was. And I said to a girlfriend, there's no decent men left in Australia, I'm out of here. And she said, well, the only person I can think of who might work and he's kind, considerate and loyal were the three words she used, was this guy called Max. Do you want to meet him? I said, sure. And was he a confirmed bachelor? <laughs> Thank you. This is not on the... He just slapped his way around Australia. <laughs> you didn't hear any of that. That is not for the record. And he would be appalled if I suggest that because he takes himself so seriously. Louise was like a force of nature. She put me in mind of uh, Margot Fontaine dancing the Firebird. Energy incarnate. She had an explosive effect on me, I have to say. I think Max was waiting to be pursued. <laughs> no one had pursued him quite enough up to that stage. And I think uh, Louis said, this, this guy is just brilliant. Um, I love him. And um, she did. Tough business politics. When I met Max, I was 28 and he was 40. <laughs> I've always been riveted by politicians by political life. Um, that, that's not going to work. And in, in a nation, you, the, like, For God's sake, that's what you've got to do. Gaffer his mouth up. <laughs> I guess that's one of the things that Max and I share. I loved well, when you oh, did Barnaby. I thought you did a beautiful well, Barnaby. I didn't, I didn't think it was very good. I thought it was fantastic. But I did have a sense that we were from um, different worlds and bringing these worlds together wasn't easy. My experience of broken home was that Marriage as an institution was not all it was cracked up to be. Louise's experience had been exactly the opposite. I don't think Max was inclined to give up his private life to anyone very easily. We were driving somewhere and he said, you know, there was a day when he looked at his mother and realised that she'd lost her mind. Um, and that was about as much as I ever heard from Max. When I was in my teens, I was conscious that my mother sacrificed her health to keeping Don and me clothed, fed, housed and schooled. And the extreme workload really was starting to take its toll. One night my mother's telling me the flags on the top of the station are at half-mast because the boss at work is sending a message to her enemies in town. So this it rings a huge alarm bell in my head. I remember some guys coming around and manhandling her to the ground and taking her off. They gave her electric shock treatment, which seemed pretty brutal. I got a call from a psychiatrist. Your mother is suicidal. She needs to be put in hospital. She has schizophrenia. It was a distressing time. I couldn't move too far away from home because I've, I had to keep in touch with her treatment and her ongoing welfare. Mum ended up in the housing commission flats. She started getting these terrible pains in the back, around the shoulders, and she was having these heart attacks, and so I'm quite sure she knew she was dying, but she wasn't telling me. And then one day, of course, I turn up and no one answers the door, so I get the key and get myself in there, and there she is dead on the bed. The sad thing I find about it is that she, she knew it was coming and she, she didn't want to upset anyone by, by telling them. I always knew that when you married somebody that you joined a family, but the Adler's are very special. Um... I think Max 
whose own family life was so fractured, felt embraced with all the complexities of marrying into the Adler family. It's been a wonderful five years and I can only see it getting better. Louise wanted to have children and I had to think about whether this was uh, something I would, should enter into. And perhaps underneath there was a sense of could he make a happy fam a family without conflict given his own background. But I was an optimistic 28-year-old and thought anything's possible, we can achieve anything. And I think he would say he was carried along by my conviction. <laughs> our daughter Mira was born in 1984 and our son Milo was born in 1987. Max was the, you know, I think the cliche today would be hands-on father. There was nothing Max wouldn't do. But he was also doing the Gillies Report and he was hard at work, you know, under great strain doing that show. In the 80s, Bob Hawke was ascendant, absolutely ascendant, the most popular, handsome man in politics. I tell you what, any boss who sacks anyone for not turning up the day is a bum. <laughs> Bob Hawke would have to rate as probably the best Labor Prime Minister of all time. And I suspect that in its own way, uh, Max's send up of Bob was an act of tribute and homage. He is looking at you, kid. <laughs> Bob Hawke was an open book. He didn't attempt to disguise his feelings. Whatever they were, they were manifest down to the tears. Of course I'm upset. Mr Hawke thoughtfully called an early election in 84, uh, about a minute before the second series, um, which was a gift, really. And because Mr Hawke didn't do notably well at that election, um, he developed a kind of eye avoidance, snappy... <laughs> Yep, yep. And Max picked that up in about 15 minutes. It was terrific. Mr Hawke, do you regret calling the election early? Uh, yep. And people were spilling out of pubs to do their imitations of Hawkey to him and all. It was as if he were the alternative R.J. Hawke. And uh, it, it, was a, it was an interesting phenomenon that lasted, you know, quite a few years. In respect of the election, uh, it's just reminded me of a joke. Uh, Max had I, to go for uh, what was amusing. Joy the outward quirks of the personality, and those he did magnificently. <laughs> but he was portraying a character, not the inner man, not the person of integrity whom I knew. Well, you never saw this under Fraser. <laughs> Porky hated the program. Uh, because it uh, didn't reveal Bob as God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost, you know, for the benefit of the Australian viewing audience, <laughs> but basically just had some fun with him. I was a publisher in the early 1990s and had the pleasure of working with Bob Hawke on his uh, memoirs. And I always remember that Bob would call me up and would begin by saying, mm, and how's that f Gillies going? Still making a living out of me, I see. And I'd say, oh, yes, yes, and can, just talking about the editorial work on your manuscript is going very well, Mr Hawke. <laughs> there was an occasion at the football breakfast when both Max as Hawke and Hawke as Hawke uh, were present, and I think probably because he could, Max was doing a better Hawke than Hawke was. I said, g'day, Bob, and he shook my hand. When I say he shook my hand, he grabbed my hand, pulled me down so that our heads were nose to nose and he playfully bops me on the nose. It was not a, just a tap. He meant to punch him in the nose. <laughs> Who could blame him? The Gillies Report uh, ran in various iterations over about eight years. Ladies and gentlemen, you please be upstanding for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Honourable Mr Alexander Downer. Max invited me to be in his next solo production, a show called The Big Con, which was set in a right-wing conservative think tank. And it was incredibly over the top, very cartoonish, very dark. We are still committed to the war in error. Max will dress up and embody the character and it becomes a caricature. It's not really an impersonation, it goes beyond that. <laughs> It's a burlesque of the character. It's a, they become clown figures that are recognisable as whoever is playing. The woman they call the body politic. <laughs> Senator Amanda Vesto! Look, I'm an easy target. I'm not small. That's an understatement. 
I don't know what he had to do to make himself look like me. I suppose he had to pat himself up and he had to get a bright shirt and stick on makeup. Let the children come to me, those who have drifted across the sea. The content of it was very much about refugee policy. And it was continuing on under Amanda Vanstone's guard. A girl could starve to death at one of these gab fests. <laughs> I do think that you would get probably raked over the coals for doing something like that now, and I think probably rightfully so. Well, most parody has an element of cruelty in it. Who, who wants to make a career out of uh, making people laugh at someone else? Not laugh generally, laugh at them. I, I, I just think you've got something missing in your character. But, you know, that's, that's what satirists do. That's, that's how they make their living. Yeah, they are. Mm. Over the years, I've tried to make sense of what there, there I are, remember of my father. Which one do you reckon that is, you or me? That'd be you. After my parents split up, uh, Dad did make overtures to see my brother and me occasionally, but Mum was dead against it. So, effectively, he disappeared from our lives. and. Uh, that's right. I grew up without a father. All the, the fathers that I ever know about are all a bit distant from their kids. Unfortunately, he died in his 50s and all of the questions that had been with me for my entire life to that point have, have remained. And then Max had the, um, I think, heartwarming um, story to confront late in life um, of what his father had been in another setting altogether. I was invited to a fundraising lunch for the school that I'd been to for Melbourne High School. In the boardroom of one of the old boys, Lindsay Fox, he ran a big trucking company. It was revealed via Lindsay Fox's wife, Paula Fox, that Max's father, Frank, had gone to live in a boarding house close to Paula's family. My father had left my mother and she had all these children and she and Frank became friends, but there was nothing there. You know, they were just companions. He used to come to our house and mum used to cook meals for him and that. And he used to love building and creating all this furniture. I remember once he took mum's whole kitchen out and built her a new kitchen. So, you know, I, I was very lucky to have known him. Uh, this was a profound shock. The mystery of what happened to my father was suddenly clear and I could tell it was the same person. I'd said goodbye to all those years ago. Never knew he had children, never. And I was too young to probably ask him, you know, what, did he have a family? I gave him a job driving one of the trucks. Did a very good job, never a problem. Went about the job, did it properly. And he was a gentle giant, very conservative, very quiet, and very much a loner. I never saw him with any mates, and I don't think he had any. When I was getting married, I asked him, would he give me away? And he was absolutely thrilled to do that and I loved Frank like a father. I was really surprised when I found out that Max was his son. It was really sad that he never grew up knowing his father because Frank really loved children. He would have been a great dad to those boys. He really would have. I was very surprised to find how comforting I found the knowledge that in my father's absence, he had found a place where his qualities had been valued and mattered. And I think that gave Max some, both immense regret probably that he'd missed out, but also a sense of, well, that's who my father was. He was a good man. New well, York, been... New York, <laughs> yes, it's a wonderful town. Life without Louise would be dull, stale, flat and unprofitable. <laughs> She's been my greatest supporter over the years in the things that I've done. 
could talk about writing a memoir. We were walking along the beach and I said, you know, all the other thespians had been publishing their memoirs. I don't want them. And I know that he's a very fine writer and would contextualise his life in a very interesting way in writing about his life and Australia. So from my point of view as a publisher, this is a nice idea for a book. So it does swim again while I can remember her saying she wanted me to write an autobiography. I can't remember whether it was a question or an order. He said, oh, do you think people would be interested? You know, sort of sort of smiling, sort of flattered. And I said, yes. And he said, but you know, I don't like doing publicity and I won't be, I wouldn't do any publicity. I mean, it mortifies me. So she stopped asking very soon after and uh, we got along, we've got along famously ever since. Called the wild ass of a man, Barry Oakley. Max will be 80 at the end of this year. Selfishly, I want him to live well and healthily for at least another two decades, minimum. So the whole thing was a disaster. I think I need him more than I ever thought I needed him. I discovered over 40 years that he is in fact kind, considerate and loyal. And they were the things that ended up being what meant most to me. Gillies, Max Gillies, you're the impersonation king. Gillies, Max Gillies, Olympic comedian. You took on Packer and Thatcher too, with your fearless production crew. Gillies, Max Gillies, and let's not forget Wendy Harmer and Tracy Harvey too. She was awesome. Gillies, Max Gillies.